So this talk is dedicated to my lifelong friend, Paul Sally. Uh, we've known each other over 50 years. We were in graduate school together. We've done research together. And we were writing a book before he passed away about six months ago. And in fact, every summer I would teach Chicago public school teachers in Paul's program. Uh, he used the VMI, my program, uh, as the K-5 arm of his uh, professional development program. So I miss Paul very much, and I'm sure many people in this room feel the same way. So as you know, I'm a research mathematician. Many of you know I'm a research mathematician, but for the past 15 years, I've been teaching elementary teachers, uh, training them to be teacher leaders and helping them improve their mathematics practice and transferring that practice into their classroom. So when uh, Theron and Angie asked me to give this talk, I thought I would tell you a little about the VMI program that we started in Vermont. And I would tell you about the inquiry-based strategies and the problem-solving methodologies that we use to transform elementary teachers, most of whom are fearful of mathematics, not good at mathematics, into teachers that are deeply knowledgeable in mathematics, love mathematics, and are enthusiastic about transferring that knowledge to their children. But I was inspired by Michael Starbird's uh, after-dinner talk last night. And I thought that instead of doing that, I would carry the theme that Michael uh, mentioned. That was the theme of Michael's talk last night and carry it a little bit further. If you missed Michael's talk, you missed a great talk. And I'll say something about it a little bit later. So I do want to tell you a little bit about the, the Vermont Mathematics Initiative. It's a statewide program and the mission is to improve the learning of all students in Vermont. Now when you do professional development with elementary teachers, you have to understand that turning them into great teachers, uh, great mathematicians, isn't the ultimate goal of the project. The ultimate goal of professional development is to turn the students of those teachers into great mathematicians. So our goal is to look at how we do with students and the students of the teachers in the VMI. We began in 1999 uh, originally with elementary teachers. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about why you should always start professional development with elementary teachers. Very quickly, it was clear that what we were doing was, was very good for middle school teachers as well. And this past year, we expanded to include high school teachers. Although we've always had some high school teachers enrolling in the program because they wanted to become teacher leaders of elementary teachers in their school district. So the goal is to train mathematics teacher leaders. We want to produce capacity in school districts around Vermont. We want teachers who are deeply knowledgeable about mathematics and can uh, improve mathematics, not just for themselves in their own classroom but for their whole school and district. There are two components. We have a three-year master's degree program. Teachers who complete that get a Master of Science in Teaching degree from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at University of Vermont. And as I say, the goal of the program is to build capacity. So the second phase of the program we call our district implementation component and that's where the teacher leaders that we've trained in our master's degree program are utilized to improve the mathematics knowledge of all the teachers in the district and the culture of mathematics in their school district. This shows the distribution of the teacher leaders that we've trained around the state. We're in 90% of the school districts, about 45% of the elementary schools, and about 12,000 students a year are influenced by the teachers that we've trained in our program, and the teachers who've taken uh, content-based courses that we give in the district that are not part of the master's degree program. And the VM, we don't advertise the VMI nationally, but uh, it's sort of taken off. 
I was on leave at Lesley University in Massachusetts. And we set up a center for, mathemat for mathematics achievement at that university. Leslie grants more graduate education degrees than any university in the country. Jim Lewis at Nebraska has uh, built his program around the VMI strategies. Uh, I noticed one of the people who's a presenter here, Diane White at uh, University of Colorado at Denver, was one of my assistants when I taught uh, our signature course, Mathematics as a Second Language in Nebraska. Right now, Jim Lewis is teaching three sections of that course to teachers in three different cities in Nebraska. At Penn State, George Andrews, past president of the AMS, is starting up his uh, program, the Pennsylvania Mathematics Initiative. Uh, and he's teaching two courses to 30 teachers from central Pennsylvania, and there are 70 or 80 who are waiting to take those courses. Uh, Sayeb Othman, a mathematician at Aurora University, another university that emphasizes teaching 60 miles west of Chicago using our program. And of course, I've, I've taught uh, in Paul's program. Uh, of course, John, John Bull is running that program now. And uh, Cincinnati Public Schools, Little Rock, Arkansas Public Schools adopted our program. And the reason for that is that wherever our program has used with fidelity, student learning has gone up. It's as simple as that. So over the past 15 years, I'm estimating I taught 70 courses to over 1,000 teachers, not counting multiplicity, because I teach some, many courses to some teachers in nine states in Australia. So that's a little bit about VMI. Now I want to say something about elementary teachers. I'm in awe of elementary teachers. I can advise PhD theses in non-commutative harmonic analysis, uh, in Lie groups, uh, special functions on manifolds. I could never be an elementary teacher. Job's too hard. You've got to teach all subjects. You have to be a child psychologist and a social worker. And in many cases, and for many children, your classroom's the only oasis of sanity in the poor kid's life. So I love teaching elementary teachers, especially primary teachers, especially kindergarten teachers, who often become your best mathematics leaders. But society doesn't appreciate elementary teachers. We look upon the schools as having to solve our country's social problems. And there are two forces at work that run counter to each other. On the one hand, more and more students are entering kindergarten remedial with no reinforcement for learning at home. And at the same time, we're raising standards, and the poor teacher's caught in the middle between the hammer and the anvil, and that teacher is left to try and run the gauntlet between the social problems and the learning that has to take place. Now, the importance of elementary teachers and elementary schools, as far as mathematics is concerned, is that we know that the mathematics learned at the elementary level is the critical ingredient in the student's success at all other levels, including college and the research frontier and scientific careers. So that's why you have to start your professional development at the elementary level. If you start at any higher level, it's remediation all the way up. Now, in my view, there are four ingredients in becoming a great teacher. They're necessary conditions, not sufficient. You have to know your students. In the case of elementary teachers, you have to know, has that child been abused? Has that child had a good breakfast? Is that child's life at home conducive to learning that particular day? And you have to know the learning style of the students so you can match your instruction to that learning style. And you have to love your students because if you love your students, your students are going to work hard for you. And if your student knows that you're going to go to the mat for that student, that student's going to love you. Now here's the, the critical difficulty. You have to know your subject and you have to love your subject. And that's where the problem exists that we as mathematicians have to fill. So I want to quote from the first um, talk of the session yesterday. Our colleagues from Westfield State reminded us that we should be engaging and empowering the disenfranchised student. And by that they meant the student who's terrified of mathematics. Now, no one is more terrified of mathematics than the typical elementary teacher. 
Elementary teacher typically has had one mathematics course in their college career, maybe two. But that course was probably focused on methodology and pedagogy and was probably taught by an education faculty member, not a mathematician. So most elementary teachers are fearful of mathematics and it's not a subject they like to teach. I could give you an analogy with reading. Would you like a language arts teacher at the elementary level to have only read C. Spot Run and Dick and Jane and the literature that you teach in first grade, second grade? No, you'd want that teacher to have read the Bible. You'd want that teacher to have read Shakespeare. You'd want that teacher to have read the great novelists and more. But that's what we do in mathematics, you see. Most mathematics teachers, most elementary teachers, if I were being gracious, I would say have a mathematics understanding at the fifth grade level, at most, you see. So that's the problem we're addressing. So I'll give you just a few problems on my pretest that are a little bit of an insight into the knowledge base of elementary teachers. Now, if you or I were solving that problem, we'd instantly use the cancellation property for division, and we find that the answer is two-fifths. But nine out of 10 elementary teachers will multiply the numerators, multiply the denominators, and then try and find how they can simplify that. And here's a problem that only one out of 37 elementary teachers in a course I recently taught could do. And here's a, uh, another typical problem where only one teacher could do it, and maybe it's the same teacher who did the other problem, and this is what most teachers did, you see. And that's what a lot of our students do when we teach our first year, year uh, entry-level mathematics courses. So you see the, ma the mathematics knowledge of elementary teachers, and in particular the um, arithmetic knowledge is very weak. And of course the difficulty is that there's nothing elementary about the mathematics taught in the elementary grades. Arithmetic is one of the deepest subjects in all of mathematics. We all know that, but elementary teachers have to know that. Arithmetic, algebra, and geometry are intimately related. Addition is arithmetic, subtraction is algebra. Multiplication is arithmetic, division is algebra. And as soon as you represent numbers on the number line and you do arithmetic on the number line, you're doing geometry, you see. Well, we know that, but elementary teachers have to know that. And if you've taught calculus courses, you know that a lot of students get a grade of F in calculus, but very few students fail calculus. What they really did was they failed arithmetic. Years learned didn't know it till they took calculus, you see. So I usually tell people that the elementary teacher has more to say about the student's success in a calculus course than I do as the instructor. So that's the summary. If we don't do a good job at the elementary level, everything else is remediation. So I was planning to show you some lessons from the Vermont Mathematics Initiative that illustrate the strategies, the inquiry-based strategies that we use and the way in which we empower teachers with uh, capability to reason and problem solve. And then I was going to show you some of the lessons that our teachers have prepared to transmit that same kind of learning to their students. But I'm not going to do that because I want to talk a little bit about what Michael said last night. And I'll be around for a couple of days. If you want to see those lessons, you want to talk about it, be happy to talk about them. And we have a large store of wonderful problem-solving lessons that lead the, students, lead the teacher to being a uh, mathematical problem solver and to understand that mathematics is problem solving and that's why we do mathematics. Okay. But Michael asked this question and he of course led up to it in his own wonderful way with great humor and insight. When should a student begin to engage creatively in problem solving and think deeply about problem solving? And Michael told a story about himself and his brother, and the reason that he was good at it and his brother was good at it is it was inculcated in his growing up. 
You see, his parents, he said, always pose problems at the dinner hour. I have two daughters, one of whom is a mathematician, very good mathematician. Some of you know her, Laura. And um, we used to do the same thing at the, at the dinner table. I remember the clinking problem when we'd have house guests. Well, that's end choose too, you know, how many clinks are there going to be when you make a toast at the dinner table? We always called that the clinking problem as the kids grew older. They'd have a problem and say, oh, that's just the clinking problem. It's end choose too, you see. And my other daughter became a medical person. She has a PhD and an MD and um, is a geneticist. And when she was in graduates in medical school, she called me one day and she was taking a pharmacology course and said, Dad, the instructor gave us this differential equation for the amount of time the drug is in the bloodstream and I think his solution is wrong. She came the next day all loaded for bear to tell the guy that he was way off base and the first thing the guy said was the solution was wrong yesterday. Um, so she's pretty good at mathematics too. And with her children at bedtime, they do what's called bedtime mathematics. But you see, it comes back to Michael's theme. Our children grow up in that environment, you see. So it's natural for them. So I came here from teaching in a very rural district. This county is about 20% larger than the state of Rhode Island. There's a total population of under 40,000. The average family income is under $30,000. And the school I was teaching in was 95% free and reduced lunch. And as I was at the front of the room, looking up at the back of the room, there was a big cloth poster that told children they should arrive early so they could have breakfast. So that school is providing breakfast to 100% of the students because if 95% are free and reduced lunch, why not give a breakfast to everyone? See? So how many of those students have the kind of conversation that Michael and his brother had with their parents? How many of those kids even have two parents? How many of those kids even have a home? So for those children, are they at home going to have reinforcement for their education? Are they at home going to learn how to be creative problem solvers, have perseverance at problem solving and be deep thinkers? So for that student who has no home life that reinforces education, the elementary teacher, the first teacher that student encounters in kindergarten, that is the only champion in that student's life. And that is why it's critically important for that teacher to have the reinforcement that's needed to help society where society isn't helping itself, you see. So that teacher is the only person that stands in the way of that student and the life that may not contribute to the lives of others. So now let me answer Michael's question. Michael asked, when should students uh, be exposed to creative uh, problem solving? And my answer is, with the first teacher that student ever encounters in their education, and with every subsequent teacher. So what we do in our professional development with elementary teachers. We do to empower the elementary teacher to be able to empower the student. There's a wonderful saying from the Talmud that when you teach the child, you teach the child of the child. And that's the importance of what we're talking about with elementary teachers. But I'm going to conclude the talk with a principle that I hope we can uh, all buy into. I believe it's the birthright of every child who wants to learn mathematics to learn it from a teacher that knows mathematics. And maybe we all do our part to help in a little way to do that. Ken, can you speak a little bit about, oh, I'm Allegra. Um, what the teacher leadership part looks like in particular when you're trying to help a teacher understand how to bring inquiry in mathematics to their colleagues who may be equally terrified of mathematics. Teacher leadership takes many forms. And what I like best, I guess, is, well, it depends on the situation. What I like best is embedded teacher leadership in which we don't take the 
teacher out of the classroom. And I think the question was, how does that teacher get started with other teachers to convey the kind of mathematics teaching that we want to see in the classroom? And I think modeling is very important. And once one sees the results with students, other teachers tend to then believe in that teacher. Um, but you know, you're never a prophet in your homeland. And I think it takes, a, for a lot of teachers, some time to build up. And you start with the teachers that are more receptive to what you're trying to do. And pretty soon, it permeates the school. That's one answer. That's a short answer to a question that requires a full semester's study. Um, if you, if it's possible, thank you, it was an excellent uh, presentation and we can thank probably you. stay here a week to talk about all the ideas that you mentioned, but you had the cartoon and you had, can you, can you go back to the cartoon? Uh, you, maybe you comment a bit of, uh, on the, you had two little uh, questions, comments there. Wait, wait, hold on just yes, a minute. That's, that's the, can you comment a bit on, on the second one? I think later on in the talk you discussed the first one, but this one, the, the higher standards, sort of, is, is that true that the higher standards right now, the, the standards are higher right now than they were 20, 30 years ago, 50 years ago? I'll give a discursive answer. You tell me if it's okay. 50 years ago, when I was in school, and some of you were in school, I had fantastic teachers. They were all women. Except for the one, one guy I had in trigonometry in high school who was a disaster. Um, so society took advantage in those days of the fact that women had not many choices in jobs. They were going to be secretaries, they were going to be nurses, or they were going to be teachers, except for the few, few uh, women who made it through the glass ceiling. So the country got along in education on the backs of very talented and smart women. When I was in the seventh grade, <clears throat> the geometry teacher, and in seventh grade we taught geometry, and it was Euclidean geometry out of a book that took care of the axioms. So you're talking about standards, we don't teach that now, even in high school, see? But the math teacher got sick. And there was no other person to teach it except the French teacher in the school. And she was wonderful. She said, I've never taught geometry. We're going to learn this together. And it's a very memorable course. And I still have the book from that course. And I still have it underlined. Um, so when you talk about standards, the question is standards relative to what? So when I use the phrase standards, I'm talking about the standards that are introduced periodically. I think um, it was Einstein who said that stupidity is doing the same thing over again and expecting to get a different result. In the 50s and 60s, we had the new math, and the curriculum was going to solve the problem. And in the 80s, in the early 90s, we had the NCTM standards. And that was curriculum, and that was going to solve the problem. And now we have the Common Core, and that's going to solve the problem. So until we, as a country, have the understanding that it's the teacher's content knowledge that's going to make the difference, we're always going to be blowing huge amounts of money with no outcomes, you see. So, I don't want to get going on that subject, but I think that's what I intended there. Happy to do that.